Here's a little bit about decide. Um, I'm not saying that you have to make every decision in your life every second at all times. There are some decisions you have to delay, and we'll talk about that when we do the D. The D is discover what you want, need, have in your life, your home, and your work. And the discovery phase is where you either become clear on your goals and priorities, or the discover phase could be the information gathering stage. So, let's say you're going through a pile of clutter in your house, and it's some, some of the clutter's not yours. It belongs to your kids, it belongs to your spouse. You may need to, in the discover phase, say, whose stuff is this, and do you want it? <laughs> do you need that? No. Okay. You may need to say, whose stuff is this, and do you want it, in the discover phase. The discover phase for paper, a lot of times people don't know what to keep and how long. So the discover phase could be going to your financial planner, your accountant, your lawyer, and your organizer and saying, here's a record retention policy that I drafted up for my home, my office, my life. Could you take a look at the record retention policy and let me know what you think and sign off on it? And then, and only then, may you feel empowered to start getting rid of some of that paper. What most people do is they say, when in doubt, they keep it. Right? When in doubt, they keep it, everything, in their entire life. So discover is a phase where you need to go through your wants, your needs, your desires, your likes, your goals, and figure out, what do I really, what am I doing with this stuff? Why am I keeping it? Okay, go ahead. Usually in, in the decide process, I actually don't have people throw out things first. That's the very next phase, that's eliminate, but yes, the, the whole goal is to throw out, he said, what about throwing out things you don't need? Absolutely. If you're in the discover phase and you can say, I don't need it, I don't want it, I don't love it, it goes to this side, which is the get rid of it. And in eliminate, we'll talk about all the ways to eliminate, because I want you to think of eliminate broadly, not just putting it in a landfill. So yes, that's definitely the second step. But in discover, discover is what I'm doing with you now. What I want, what do I love, what do I need? Why is this in my life? Have I even really thought about it in the last few years? If what's holding me back is I need a decision about it, then can I make the decision in a vacuum or do I need someone else to assist me to make that decision? And so discover is really the first step in the process. Can any of you think of an example how you're not discovering and it's holding you back? Well, something's wandering to your life. <laughs> like a lot of kids. <laughs> Hi, I'm a book. I'm just going to wander into your life. <laughs> like you didn't make the decision to bring it into your home but someone gave it to you okay. and, and you it's don't even example. know if you like it. Yep, good example, but it's so, there. So, unwanted gifts, right? People give you things. Uh, how many of the, you, how many of you has, have had this? All of us, right, yeah. The gift that you didn't want. And that's a tough one because it's loaded with guilt. And if you were brought up in an Italian family, there's even more guilt. <laughs> so you have to ask yourself, can I eliminate this by passing it on, by paying it forward, by giving it to someone else, or, do I need to keep this because the person maybe comes over and visits often and they flip out and you maybe would completely make your mother-in-law hate you if you don't put out the gift? So this, this plays into a little more issues of you know, guilt and trust and control. But I will tell you that if you keep every single thing in your life that you're ever given that you don't like, want, or need, you will have piles of clutter. So you do have to start to say to people, now what I say is blame me. I went to this organizing workshop and I've decided to you know, turn over a new leaf. And so for Christmas this year, I want experience gifts only. You know, I want to go out to lunch with you, spend time with you, write me a poem, bake me some brownies, but I don't want stuff. I'm sort of going on this new mission. I don't need anything. I pretty much have everything in my life that I want. And if I need something, I'll go out and buy it. But from you, I want your time, your love, your attention, whatever. So you can use this as an example of something that you're using to change your life. Anyone else can think of the discover phase? where they realize they get stuck. A catalog comes and you think there's something in there that you want, but then by the time you go back and actually do it, like the coupons expire. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a double example of a delay decision. <laughs> um, usually I tell my clients, if you like catalogs, use the one in, one out rule. So if catalog come, the next month comes in, the last month goes out to the recycling bin. As far as, you know, the delay decision of do I, do I want to order that, usually most people look at things and it's sort of like, oh, wouldn't that be great? I should order that. But they don't order it because deep down they realize they don't want it, use it, or need it. 
And so if, you know, three months later come and you open up the catalog and you realize you haven't ordered it and the coupon expired, chances are it was not that important to you. If it was, you would have pulled out that thing you wanted with the coupon and you would have acted on it. You would have gone ahead and put it in your action file and went online and ordered it. But that is a good example of a delayed decision, both of the catalog sitting there and of the thing. Okay, so I think what you're asking is during the paper management process. Okay, that's a little different. Yeah, yeah, it's all paper, right? So the problem with paper is paper is one of the hardest things for people to make decisions on. Okay, it's a lot easier to pick up a thing. Like, am I going to wear this shirt? It's a lot harder to pick up a piece of paper and say, do I need to keep this? Because sometimes you don't know the answer to that. You may need to go out and get the answer. When you need to go out and get the answer, and you know, you know that's going to take time, you wind up not getting the answer, and you put it in the maybe pile, and that's how it piles up. But I think your question is, during the paper management process, where do you put the pending paper? Is that yeah, some, some uh, gurus like David Allen and a few others believe that you should have a pending file where you put everything you're waiting for an answer on and then once you get the answer, it either becomes a permanent record, which by the way, if I asked you how much paper really truly needs to be in your life, would you know the answer, the percentage? Percentage what point you actually need to keep? Tiny bit more. Say that again? The most important documents. Right, but what's the percentage of paper on a scale of 0 to 100%? A little more. I'm sorry, 25. 20. 20. Uh -huh. Yep. So that means that we only retrieve 20% of what we file. I can't expect you to go back after, let's say, a seminar and get rid of 80% of the paper in your life. But if you could get rid of even 20% of that 80%, then I've done my job. So ask yourself, what am I holding on to all this paper for? And the most important paper in your life we call your vital documents. If you were evacuated, God forbid, okay, we've had all these things going on in the world, tsunamis and hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes. If you had to evacuate, could you grab your vital documents and go? If you can't, that is an exercise that I'd like you to work on. There are lots of products now that are self-made. There's one on my website called SecuraVault. Uh, I'm sorry, PortaVault by Securita. It's a company that um, has partnered with organizers. And basically, it puts all of your documents that are vital in one place. Now, some of you may say those documents are in a safe deposit box. And if so, then you don't need to do this at home. At home, you probably just have your copies. If you have a safety deposit box and the papers are there, that's a whole other issue. Um, I, I didn't even mention this when we started. I'm, my former life is I'm an attorney. And once you're an attorney in New York, you're pretty much an attorney until you die, <laughs> unless you re uh, retire yourself, and in order to do that, you actually have to go through the courts. And so basically, I'm an attorney, and I left the practice of law after nine and a half years and became a certified professional organizer. And organizing is run by um, the industry, has a wonderful association called NAPO, and it stands for the National Association of Professional Organizers. And there are about 4,000 of us now in the country. We just had our conference out in San Diego, which was awesome. It's a great conference. Picture, you know. 800 organizers together. <laughs> My husband's like, is that actually any fun? <laughs> a bunch of crazy type A people. I'm like, but we're not. <laughs> a lot of us are right brain, I swear. Um, but the reason I bring that up is uh, sometimes my attorney hat will come on and uh, just you know, kick me if I do that. Because basically, there's another whole issue of a safety deposit box. And the problem is if you and let's say your spouse are the only signatories to that safety deposit box and you die together, it gets sealed until everything goes through probate. So something to think about is maybe having someone else be a signer so that they could get in there and get the stuff rather than having to wait eight or nine months to go through probate. So, that, so let's just move away from that realm. Um, but yes, papers are really hard for people. So what I think you're asking is um, what I call your tickler file. And your tickler file is your inbox of unprocessed paper. Let's say it's the mail that's come in. Then your next section might be action, which are things you know you need to act on and that if you put them away, you're going to forget. Your next section may be to file. That's the 20% only that you need to keep. Okay, that's the most important. That's your financial, your medical, your vital documents. 
The next one might be to read. Maybe those are the articles that you've pulled out of the magazines and newspapers instead of keeping the piles of magazines and newspapers. And by the way, my to read is portable. And the reason for that is I hardly ever, I read at home books, either business books or you know fun books, novels. When I read things like an article that I pulled out, it's when I'm on the it's when I'm on the road. It's when I'm sitting on the subway or at the doctor's office or you know my nephew's soccer game or something like that. So really think about maybe your to read being portable if you're someone that's you know uh, walking around or you know traveling by public transportation. If you travel by car the way I do, I have my iPod hooked up in my car and my I have a university my Beetle is a university on wheels. I'm just listening to tons of podcasts and audio programs and CDs because I am an auditory learner. And I'm such a strong auditory learner that I actually, when I want to reinforce something, I audio record myself. And even if I never listen to that audio recording again, it's gone like in the audio recorder in my brain and it's done. And if you're very kinesthetic tactile, you will have to take notes at all times because, and you'll never look at your notes again, but the process of taking notes helps you learn. <laughs> It's like this magic thing. So picture inbox, action, to read, to file, to shred. And all of you need a cross-cut shredder. About 39 to 59 staples. A single cut makes strips. A cross-cut makes confetti, which the crazy but very smart identity theft people can never put it back together. So you want a cross-cut shredder. And I don't want to hear the excuse, oh, I don't need that. I just sort of rip it. Not good enough in this day and age. <laughs> A fireplace is different. If you have a fireplace, you're good. Because a lot of my clients now that have a fireplace are burning all the paper instead of shredding it. Interesting. Okay. Nice way to put it to use. Um, the, other, the other thing is some of my clients now have a to scan in their little particular file. To scan. Because it's something they know they want to keep in electronic form, but they don't need it in hard copy. And I'm going to challenge you that that 80% of paper that you don't need, a lot of it you can find someplace else. So here's a little acronym. You can tell I'm an acronym girl. Uh, WASTE, W-A-S-T-E. And I'm just going to erase this for one second. This is how you determine if you need a paper. WASTE. Is it worthwhile? Will I use it again? That's key. People are like, you know, they keep stuff, but they might not use it again. Can I find it somewhere else? And I'll give you some great examples of that. What will happen if I toss it? And do I need the entire item, or can I just pull out the piece I need? This comes from Organizing for Dummies by Eileen Roth. Great little, you know, basic book. My book's better. We'll talk about that soon. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. It's a great book. So waste. Is it worthwhile? Will I use it again? Can I find it somewhere else? Will anything happen if I toss it? And do I need the entire item? And the key to the, will I find it somewhere else, is in this day and age, you almost always can find it somewhere else, which is amazing. So I was working with a client recently on medical. Okay. Now, for those of you that do not take a medical deduction on your taxes, and if you don't know what I mean by that, it means you probably never took it. Anyone an accountant in the room? 7.5% uh, of your adjusted gross income. So let's just pretend, because I'm so bad at math, that you make $100,000 a year. That would mean your medical bills would have to be above 7,500 out of pocket. Not many people can do that if they're insured. If you're not insured, boy, can that go up quickly. But if you take a medical deduction expense, you need to have things to prove that medical deduction expense. And so the client said, what about the EOBs? Those are your explanations of benefits. And the thing with the explanations of benefits is you can almost always now find them somewhere else. And it's amazing. My U.S. Healthcare, you know, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, they all have a website now, and you put in your username and password, and all your EOBs are there. Big Brother is watching. And that used to be a bad thing. Now it means you don't have to keep all the crappy paper. So start to ask yourself, can I find it somewhere else? Do you take into consideration your client first? Because I'm one of the only people in the room that doesn't have a computer. Right. So okay. therefore I have more more clutter because I don't have it and so I okay. also yep. panic when when you're younger and you're gonna sit there and tell me how wonderful my world could be because everything <laughs> is somewhere else and then that's another guilt trip, hysterical. Oh, I mean I could go to that lecture too. Okay. So I mean, do you do you take it from who you're dealing with of and course. then help them? Yeah. Because I'm starting to panic. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. And so, so you're yeah. all into 
to this iPad in the car, and I mean, I have WCBS at them, and that's it. <laughs> right, you know. right. So, by the way, you may not be alone. We Thank you. Yes, four yeah. of us in the no. world. Yeah. But there, I have several clients that don't have computers, and you do organize differently for them because they do have to keep more hard copy paper to support their tax deductions. The issue then becomes organizing around the client's style, habits, needs, wants, etc. So, in order for you to maintain an organizing system, you would have to feed the organizer what you think you're going to maintain and what you think you're not going to maintain. And you just have to be really honest. So you would have to say, this is something simple. Like, let's say you do a little accordion thing and you put it on your desk. And it would have monthly bills in the front slot and you could put the monthly bills in there. And some of my clients will keep a year of bills. And they'll literally put a rubber band around it and then they'll put it with that year's taxes and they'll archive it in the attic or the basement. The key is that you have to work with your system and your style, no one else's. So if you're not on a computer, then the somewhere else is only going to be, let's say, financial statements from Merrill Lynch or something like that, or Fidelity or Vanguard. You might have to call your guy or gal over at Fidelity and say, do you keep these on the system, the computer for Vanguard or Fidelity, or do I have to keep these? And usually the answer to that is, these are all on our computer and our database. So let's say you rolled over your IRA, you wouldn't need all the monthly statements, you might just need the original one to show the basis of when you took it out. That's just like one example. You still can get rid of paper, but maybe not as much as someone that has everything in the cloud, they call it, which is all online. So the key is knowing the way that you process paper and the way that you work with it. And that's just one example is paper. But I will say that if you don't have a computer, the one thing you'll have more of in your life is paper. And yet, having said that, I have a client that has no computer, and she is not in the data with paper because she's really good at going through the paper and deciding what she needs to keep and making those phone calls. And that's going back to the discover phase.